I, I just want to start by reading something that I wrote two days ago. You're speaking about fierceness. You talked about the fierce urgency, right? And two days ago, I wrote, loving your neighbor can get ugly sometimes if you're trying to harm the least of these. Yeah, I just might get a little fierce as one should. I found that really cosmic that I wrote that two days before this morning. But I would like, I would love to hear you unpack fierce just a little bit more. Hmm. What you meant by fierce and what are the boundaries of fierce in the context of Christian character? Mm -hmm. uh, four minutes. So, uh, <laughs> I, well, I said it, so I, I, I think... What happens in me when I hear, because I've listened to Dr. Martin Luther King's words a lot when he uses that phrase, the fierce urgency of now. And what he was doing was responding to critics who were saying that he and the civil rights movement were moving too fast. Right? They were trying to move white people before they were ready. And that they should take a more gradual approach to the changes that they were advocating for. And in that context, I think Dr. King's use of the word fierce meant it was kind of like, no, this is urgent, we can't wait. And if we allow right, the majority people to determine the speed at which we uh, advocate for justice, we will never get there, right? Uh, so, you know, why we can't wait? We can't wait because, as Dr. King said in another context, wait always means never, right? So the fierceness meant that we, we cannot worry about the... Uh, condemnations of the majority culture or of people who cling to their privilege and power and just say, I'm not ready yet, right? When Jesus called the disciples, they didn't give him the I'm not ready yet, right? Matthew says, they drop their nets and follow him. That was fierce. That was fierce. They had a lot at stake that they put at stake. Their relationships with their father, their kinship networks, right? Their economic uh, history. They didn't know where they were going or what, but bang, let's go. Fierce. Fierce. There was a, a part in the book that talked about this where, and this was very Presbyterian, right? They talk, were talking about the General Assembly in the mid- 19th century and how there were resistance stories. There were people who wrote amazing speeches that try to address General Assembly to discuss this issue and to really move us toward abolition and the ending of slavery. Fabulous writings that several people that we got to learn about in this book. In this one point, in this one example, General Assembly said, oh, okay, um, well, we have a lot of things on our docket right now. Let's put it here. So they worked through the docket of all these other things that were more important. And then when they got toward the end of the agenda, they said, you know, we don't have enough time. Let's put it off till the next session. Okay, so General Assembly comes around again to meet the year later. There was a, a motion on the floor to permanently postpone discussion of slavery. And then it disappeared. It goes to this notion of wait wait, here, wait forever now, postponement of discussion permanently. And then yeah. several examples of ministers telling congregants if they had concerns about slavery, the best thing you can do is to pray and wait. Those were the words. Thoughts and prayers. Yeah, I can re remember having a conversation with one of our ruling elders at the beginning of a year, and there were a number of changes in the way that our church lives. And that person said, well, we have to wait until people are comfortable with these changes. And I said, well, if people are comfortable with them, then they ain't changes. 
right? It has to be something we wouldn't do. That's what Christ called his first disciples, and that's what God calls us to.